you can change life cycle of many animals at night time. And you can, in fact, impact human societies as well. This is something we have learned in the past, especially in the past five, six years, that the new LEDs in the white blue part of the spectrum are very much impacting us as well. And this is not about a small issue. Uh, we are talking about relation to cancer. We are talking about relation to um, poor immune system, um, bad memory storage. So it's a major issue that it's just revealing at the moment. And it's not something comes from a photographer three years ago. American Medical Association officially announced that white blue LEDs are harmful to human body. And that's why in many cities, major cities in the US, it's um, not permitted to use LEDs at temperature above 3000 Kelvin for street lights, including some of the areas nearby, like in the city of Salem, very close to here, all the lights has changed to between three to 4000 Kelvin. While previously it was mainly um, decided to be at 5,000 Kelvin and higher because it's more intense. It's showing, apparently showing more, but it's not because um, the light illuminating one area heavily, but then makes very dark shadows at other areas. And it creates glare and other problems. I, I will end my talk about this because it's really a major story. We need to share this. Uh, most of your academics in this room have connections to media and we need to share this story more widely. Most people have never heard about the term light pollution. I start with some of the places I frequently visit. Some of, some of the astronomers are in connection with us observatories in Atacama Desert, and this is why. This is a paradise to astronomers because it's so dry. It has more than 300 clear nights per year in most parts of Atacama. The sky is very transparent, thanks to high altitude being close to the ocean, and it's away from light pollution. I go there every two years, sometimes more frequently, on assignment for European Southern Observatories. This is how a night begins in northern part of Atacama Desert. Beginning of the night, sky is dominated by a yellow-green light caused by a natural emission from the Earth's upper atmosphere known as air glow. It's always there. In some nights it's more intense and in some areas like in southern part of America, South America, especially Argentina, Chile. Then the Milky Way rises around midnight just before the moon rises over this major volcano known as Likankabur and turns everything almost to daylight. From Atacama, now we are in the southern part where the most well-known observatory in the area is located, known as the VLT, Very Large Telescope on Cerro Parano. But you're not looking at the telescope itself. It's the hotel. It's the residency of astronomers. It's built underground in order to protect, uh, preserve humidity. They have, in fact, a tropical forest inside, very small, <laughs> very a miniature tropical forest just under here with a very nice pool where nobody swim. <laughs> At least I have not seen, I was the only one who used that. <laughs> but they need that because astronomers going there for a month or two weeks and this place has nothing. When you go out, you look around, it looks like Mars. You're walking on Mars under the Earth sky. For many miles, there is no sign of any life. There is not even one single plant for many miles. So imagine being an astronomer there for a long time you become crazy unless you have something proper <laughs> for your accommodation. In this video, we are moving from the ceiling of the residency on Sir Parnal towards the galactic core. Time lapse video is going to take us to one single satellite in the background of the sky. Can you see that? Some of 
the national parks are my favorite places to document the night sky because um, the sky is protected at night as part of our natural landscape. So the idea of protecting the night sky in national parks is not only for stargazing, because animals need natural night environment. It's essential to protect the night as well as you protect daytime resources in nature as well. Yellowstone and Grand Teton are two national parks almost connected together in Wyoming, and they're both part of the International Dark Sky Association program, uh, where designate places under a name called Dark Sky Park or Dark Sky Reserve. There are several different categories. Yellowstone is amazing for the landscape as well. Here I have illuminated the hot spring with a portable LED light in this short exposure of 20 seconds. In the sky, bright star Antares is almost setting behind the hot spring. You can see it here. It's one of those stars which is near the end of its life cycle. It's already a red giant. Across the planet, now we are in Australia. On the southern coast of Australia, you're looking towards the Southern Ocean. The next major landmass is nothing but Antarctica. So you have nothing in the southern coast and absolutely free of light. Unless these areas, which are still a part of Australia, further down, this one is a mine, this one is a little town. In the sky, the major constellations of the southern hemisphere are about to set over the ocean, including the Southern Cross and bright star Alpha Centauri. This is the closest star, the closest major star to our solar system, about four light years away, and not visible from this latitude in Northern Hemisphere. Again, across the planet, we are in Nepal. Out of many trips I have done in the past 20 years documenting the night sky of our planet, Nepal has been my most favorite. I've been to Antarctica, to many bizarre locations, but still Nepal is on top of my list. Due to crystal clear sky at high altitude and at the same time the most stunning scene you can imagine on this planet. Lutsi and Amadablan are neighboring mountains to Everest. Everest is just behind that hill in this shot. The scene is illuminated by quarter moon. Speaking of illumination, a natural night environment, um, ambient light. I do not do composite photography, so I like to clarify this usually at the beginning. These are single exposure photographs, either single exposure, single frame, or single exposure series to make a panorama for higher resolution image. But the exposure and setting is not changed. If it's not that case, I will explain it in the picture why I have made number of exposures for technical reasons. Um, night escape photography in general is part of nature documentation. And if we regard this as realistic documentation of nature, then we cannot relocate, add, remove a celestial object from the image. We cannot replace a moon from another side of the horizon to the mm, favorite landmark we have. If it's, it was not there, you cannot do that in natural documentation of our environment. It's similar to, you know, in wildlife photography. Nobody multiply a number of cheetahs in one scene, you know, just to make it more. <laughs> or nobody add a lion on top of an elephant. You know, it's very obvious. But if people change the location of moon in the picture, Nobody cares because people think that celestial objects are there for decoration. No, they're natural elements. We cannot change them in the picture. So that's the base of the World at Night project. Um, although we are approaching number of messages for public outreach, but our criteria in order to create the image is not to relocate or change the natural position and appearance of the image. Of course, images are enhanced in post-processing in order to reduce noise, preserve sharpness, increase contrast, sometimes enhance the color a bit, but they're not changed or altered in the way that change completely the reality. Later on this night in Nepal, 
the moon was about to set. This is last qu first quarter moon, so that means it's setting about midnight. As the moon was setting over Amadablam, I was already in total darkness. I was at 4,000 meters altitude. Amadablam is 6,800 meters, so it's still receiving the last rays of the moon. But Mars was rising right about the same time, together with a star cluster at top known as Beehive. I would say some of the most dramatic scenes I have seen at night is moonset and moonrise, when it's right about uh, the perfect time. A new project I did in Antigua, in Caribbean. <coughs> in this season, January, this was taken in late January, most people think that the Milky Way galactic core is only visible in summertime, which is not correct. Starting in January, if you're in low latitude in Northern Hemisphere, you, you begin to see the Milky Way rising just before the morning twilight. And this is exactly at the, at the break of down. The red you see here is the beginning of twilight. And the Milky Way is about to rise. The galactic core is somewhere here near the um, famous nebula known as Lagoon. And there is a nice green meteor captured on this time-lapse sequence. So I selected one shot of the sequence of 1,000 images, which was made into a video, but one of the shots was interesting with that meteor. Not every night is clear. And the good thing about night escape photography uh, in places which are very cloudy is that you don't need a clear sky. Sometimes you're aiming for fine art perspective. Sometimes you're aiming for an atmospheric phenomena. Like in this picture, you see an atmospheric phenomena around the reflection of the moon. The moon itself is overexposed which is known as corona. It's a colorful appearance of clouds due to refraction. This is Maine, in northern Maine in November. Some of the projects I did were a bit challenging uh, due to the location. This was in 2009 for Algeria National Observatory project. They were looking for PR images of the surrounding area of this site. The site is amazing. It's a high altitude mountain in almost inside Sahara, uh, but then we went further down to Tassili National Park, which is a World Heritage Site at the border of Niger, 300 kilometers away from the first village, from the first light bulb, I would say. So it was very remote, but the problem was mainly the temperature, because the assignment was very late in season, in May. And in May, in daytime, this area is easily over 120 degrees Fahrenheit, so near 60 degrees Celsius. At the nighttime, still, it was nearly 35 to 40 degrees Celsius, a paradise for snakes and scorpions. <laughs> Definitely not for human at that time. <laughs> I really enjoyed that trip, but I think I have seen enough snakes for the entire of my life. <laughs> and these are not necessarily local people. This, this one is an astronomer, it's an astrophysicist, <laughs> but in local dress because it works perfectly in this condition because of sand. Some images are made in the middle of cities, in Boston, London, Paris, because we like to show people how much we are disconnected from the night sky, how much we are ignoring the natural beauty of night. You know, there are thousands of people going on this night through Champs Elysees in Paris. Nobody look at the conjunction of Moon and Venus. And then the story is partly about light pollution. We need some of the lights for safety, for security, sometimes for identity, sometimes for advertising, but most of the light we are using it's not necessary, it's not essential. So that's the part we call it light pollution. Light pollution is not the light we need and properly use. For a modern society, we definitely need night, lights. Astronomers or photographers are like me and environmentalists are not against light at night, just about proper use of it. I was waiting for a very moment that the moon was hanging above the ark and going through the towers in, the, in La Défense, which is um, the modern part of Paris. So these are not the stars. 
these are the top of the towers, and the moon is just gliding through them. But unfortunately, when you're shooting with a telephoto lens from a long distance, in order to align a monument and the moon, you have to be on a very perfect location, if you don't want to Photoshop it, of course. And this perfect location was in the middle of a street for <laughs> 45 minutes. So I'm really honored to be captured or addressed by police officers in every single country. <laughs> Probably except for yeah, Iceland. I've never seen a police officer in Iceland. I'm there every six months. Never seen a police officer <laughs> except for airport. So anywhere you can imagine. And this was the same story. Exactly at the best time they came. And they started asking, of course, but usually ends up in a very peaceful, happy <laughs> ending because Everyone has some interest in the night sky, at least from their childhood, some connection to it when the sky was not vanished by the lights. And it worked here too. In a few places it didn't work. I was kept in a room for a whole night and images were removed because I was shooting a hidden military station in the middle of the desert nobody were aware of. <laughs> Art, technique, moment and story are essential elements I like to include in the picture. Usually art and technique is very obvious, but then comes a story which is uh, lost in many images shared by um, typical astrophotographers. We really need more a story in, in order to engage people with the night sky. The story here in Boston oops, was again this connection from the night sky. And I was wondering, as I was filming this, I was wondering how many people in these towers are actually seeing the people behind them or aware of the present moon tonight setting over the city. It's, um, it's from about three miles away, so it's a super telephoto lens. You can actually see some of the craters on the moon, atmospheric refraction and distortion causing the moon to change the view, but at the same time also changing the color of the moon to yellow. Yeah, I'm sure they stop it right here. Sorry about that. This screen is pretty large. Some private things happening in one of the rooms. I don't want to <laughs> alter privacy of people. But please use shades when you're in one of these homes because there are some nasty astrophotographers shooting with a very long telephoto lens <laughs> from large distance. From Boston to where I come from. I, I lived in Iran for 30 years, first 30 years of my life. I uh, left there about 11 years ago. And this was the mountain I frequently visited when I was based there as a photographer and uh, science journalist. It's called Mount Damavand. It's only 70 kilometers away from the capital. It's a live volcano, not super active, but it's not extinct. Uh, and the last eruption was a few thousand years ago, but it's still it's potential danger for the capital. But it's so symmetrically beautiful that um, we're really, um, really captured me since childhood. And this winter night, um, I was shooting this peak, which is about 5,600 meters. It's 16,000 feet, uh, the highest live volcano in Asia and the largest, highest mountain in, in the Middle East, with Polaris at top. So that star near the top is marking our north celestial pole. That means the axis of Earth rotation is here. This is the Earth rotating, and because the axis is pointed towards randomly towards a rather bright star, we see Polaris as a fixed star in the sky. But it's not completely fixed. If you look closer, you see it's about one degree off from the celestial pole. In the southern hemisphere, we have no similar star. It's completely empty. You will see it in a few pictures. And also, in some later time, like a few thousand years from now, you don't have Polaris as your north celestial pole marker anymore. These type of images are challenging to create, not because of long exposure, but because of airplanes and satellites. This is Grand Canyon National Park in a moonlight night. 
I have used the last bit of twilight on the left, some towns on the other side, in Utah side, and the sky was perfectly clear, except for massive number of airplanes. Unless you wait until 2 or 3 in the morning, this is what you see in the sky. Some images are showing the technical frontier of photography. This was taken last year and is showing you a single exposure of 15 seconds with a camera modified for astronomy. That means this camera made by Nikon D8, D810A and now we have a Canon version She's newer EOS RA. These are made for astrophotography. They have open um, receiving at the end of a spectrum, the red part. Most cameras are cutting that red end in order to keep the sharpness and get rid of some of the optical issues, like the Moore effect. Um, but if you remove that and change this cutting just a bit later, near the red end, around 650 nanometer, I would say, this is the uh, H alpha area, very important for astronomy because most of these nebulosity, the red ones you're seeing, are shining exactly there. And these cameras are cutting that light. So if we change that filter, which is known as IR cut, then we modify the camera for astronomy to receive more of the red end of the spectrum. And then if you have a very sensitive camera in only 10-15 seconds, you can capture nebulosities which used to be very challenging subjects for astrophotographers, even using telescopes. Now with newer cameras, of course very high altitude location and transparent sky, you can capture it with a landscape in a single exposure. To me, 10 years ago, this was impossible. You see Antares here on the right side. Uh, these are some reflection nebula, some emission nebula. This is known as Cat's Pow. This is almost the center of the galaxy. And these are the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. And this is not a star. It's a cluster of about 100,000. It's a globular cluster just next to Antares. A frequent question I receive is, are the images edited? And I explained that at the beginning. This particular image is edited more than I do. And I use it in the presentation for this purpose, to show you when you enhance the color too much, what would be the image. This is a too much enhanced color. But still, we will see part of this image with our naked eye. Another question I receive, what would we see in a night like this with our own vision? So this is Grand Teton. The Milky Way is, is over the light of the nearby town of Jackson in Wyoming. The last beat, was it the uh, rising? The rising moon on the other horizon is shining on the peak. So it's very important to capture these images on perfect time because if you want to use the ambient light, 10 minutes later, the moon is too bright. Five minutes before, the moon is very faint. You can't capture any light on the peaks. So timing is important. But here is the answer to that question. This is almost what you see with the naked eye. So it's darker, it's less color. The color of the um, galaxy, I would say, is completely gone. Nobody can um, see the color of the Milky Way. It's so diffuse. You may see the shadow cast by the Milky Way in most ideal dark location. You can see that, but you never see the color of the Milky Way. However, you see the color of brighter stars. Another question, what is the color of the Milky Way? If you look across the you know, social media and online, you see the Milky Way in every possible sing color of the spectrum. And people often ask, which one is true? Is the Milky Way changing color every night? <laughs> I mean, this is scientifically, it's, it's impossible. So I did a test 10 years ago with this image from Iran. Um, I used a modified camera. In a modified camera, if you don't color balance the image later on, it will be very bizarre. So I posted this. Three days later, posted that one is almost perfect color. Um, that blue coming from the first twilight um, light from the east. And this is completely false color. 
So I received 10 times more interaction on this image, 10 times. So that means why some photographers are altering their image to this fake color because they receive more like and interaction on social media. But to me, this is like changing the color of an elephant to red. You never had a red elephant. It's very obvious to people. But since we don't see the color of the Milky Way with our own eyes, nobody knows what is the real, of the real color. And I really urge um, lecturers and astronomers in this room who are doing such talks for public to talk about this as well, because um, people get better understanding of the natural, natural night of sky. Now we are in the Southern Hemisphere. You're looking at the Southern Cross on one side and the Galactic Center on the other side. Southern Cross is an important part of culture to many countries in the Southern Hemisphere. It's on the flag of five countries, inclu including Brazil, Australia, and New Zealand, and two smaller nations. Especially Brazil has probably the most astronomical flag you can imagine. <laughs> And that image was made in a sugar can in Brazil. When using a telephoto lens with a modified camera, images go much beyond the human ability to record celestial objects. This is far beyond our naked eye abilities. Revealing some of the smaller objects, the star cluster and Carina Nebula, as well as the Southern Cross on the left side captured recently in Antigua. Single exposure of eight seconds. Other challenge and benefits of shooting at night time includes lack of sleep, of course. <laughs> includes being in cold, freezing places where when people are enjoying a nice dinner with their family and friends, <laughs> When people are going to parties, cinema, you're out there alone. But then you feel connected to the universe and Earth at the same time. It's such a unique feeling. I can't really describe it with words. But you feel connected to your past and future, being under an ocean of stars. And then listening to nocturnal species, uh, making sounds when everybody left the area. You're alone with the entire nature. And this connection is so unique to me that I never regret lack of sleep in more than 20 years. And unfortunately, that caused some health issues. Um, but very few photographers probably do that to my extent. But to me, according to my doctor, already made issues because of so many years of no proper sleep. On average, I'm out shooting about 70 to 100 nights, um, and that's you know, about one-fourth of the year I don't have proper sleep. Because when you sleep in daytime, it's not equivalent. Um, it's not the same. Um, I use sometimes melatonin, um, like small melatonin to, to help. Um, that helps. And, but that knowledge was not available, you know, 10, 10 years ago or so. And people were afraid of using that. Now we know it's natural, probably has very little or no side effect to my knowledge. A night on the southern coast of New Zealand, near the town of Christchurch. <coughs> you go to a national park exactly at the time when everybody are leaving that area. And it's a very unusual work, for sure, because you're in very wrong time, active. But then that experience of loneliness under the universe is very unique. And astrophotographers are coming from all variety of um, expertise and work and levels of education. It's not necessarily a physicist. I studied physics, then changed to science journalism. But many people coming from art and other parts of our society. My friend Roger is a Hollywood voice actor. And he's doing astrophotography as his main hobby. And he's very, very serious on that. He's also uh, trying to protect the night sky. And he's a very good model to be frozen for five seconds. <laughs> Perfect. No movement. My story started with this telescope. 
25 years ago, or a bit more. Um, when I was a teenager, I found this telescope from a neighbor uh, who never used it. I borrowed it. The first look to the moon changed my life. It was very simple, but I still remember this moment second by second. Because I couldn't believe there are so much details visible of another celestial body through such a small telescope, which is only two-inch reflector. Then we made a small group with another friend of mine who is also a part of the World at Night team based in LA now, and an archaeologist. So we made a common interest between astronomy and archaeology. Then I started a TV program um, in year 2001. That program still continues by the producer and founder of it. Um, I was teaching astronomy, practical astronomy, to um, people, amateur astronomers, and this is typical uh, Iranian going for a stargazing on the night. Probably a bit different from what you see on the news. Well, well, these are you know, just typical people from Tehran going to their site, two hours drive from Tehran every clear weekend. Definitely not in Iran. <laughs> I continued um, as a documentary producer for about 10 years. We were chasing solar eclipses in every possible continent um, and uh, made a documentary about connection of eclipses and cultures and how we all come together under the path of shadow. Uh, this was in Panama in 2006. I um, collaborated with Astronomers Without Borders, which founded in 2007 by my colleague Mike Simmons. And we um, initiate the World at Night together within this uh, organization. It's a nonprofit for astronomy outreach and education, uh, but more for connection uh, through cultural, making cultural bridges through astronomy. And this was a night with uh, Astronomers Without Borders in Nepal. We brought this telescope donated to the, um, to the society, and we didn't know that this was the first public astronomy night for the city. So there were hundreds of people. I, I, I was not really expecting that. And we only had a few telescopes. <laughs> but then I remembered my own teenagehood when this view changed my life. Amateur astronomers and professionals sometimes come together uh, in observing nights known as the Star Party. This is not far from you, uh, an event called Astronomy Retreat in Maine, in the town of Washington. Every year we do it in July and August uh, for about one week. People come from all across uh, the state, some, a few from outside as well, from especially UK. And they observe together. We have talks in daytime. Sometimes we have lectures from uh, your institute in CFA um, or elsewhere. Last year there was an astronaut. Uh, and this year I'm going to do a photography retreat right after that, in case you're interested. It's, uh, the date is announced on my website, but it's not open for registration. It will be in about a week. It's going to be on August 22 to 26. A stargazing and photography retreat in Maine. Um, three and a half hour, almost four hour drive from here. A big part of Tuan is about the World Heritage Sites and our cultural landmarks. Why? Because it's the best communication between art, humanity, and science we can find. People know these landmarks by showing images unusual images of these landmarks taken at nighttime. First, this is a world heritage in a totally different light that people are used to see it. Second, they get instant contact um, with, with the landmark, and then you can open up to astronomy and night sky. So it's a very good bridge for astronomy communication or to preserve the night sky. This is in Armenia, a world heritage site known as Gerard. It's a monastery. Half of it is built inside the mountain as a cave. It was a hidden church inside. But going to these world heritage sites is challenging. First, permission from UNESCO. Our, connection, our project is kind of connected to UNESCO, but it's still you need local contacts and local permits. And then it's heavily illuminated when you get there, and they cannot turn off the lights due to security. 
So there are some major challenges to document these locations. Some of them are dark sky protect areas, like this one, Lake Tekapu in New Zealand has a famous iconic church of Good Shepherd, and it's within a dark sky protected area. So ideal location for such a project. The Carina Nebula is once again shining in the center with Southern Cross on the right side. You may wonder by now, after seeing several images of the Southern Cross, what this black area is next to it against the Milky Way. This is a large nebula, a dark nebula. It's more dusty than a usual nebula absorbing the light and therefore we see black in the visible light, not in infrared. And it's known as a funny name, Colsac. Some of these heritage areas are really old, prehistoric petroglyph areas. This one in central Iran has about 40,000 pictures across the valley. And this panel has uh, several layers of civilization on top of each other. One from most probably from um, the Ice Age because these animals were not visible after the Ice Age in the Middle East. And some later on when the hunters came, when the horse riders came, it was 6,000 years ago, so this is probably 17,000. On the right side of this panel, there is another one. And while I was shooting this, well, there's a story here. We don't know exactly what was happening, but um, a wolf, Asiatic cheetah, um, probably two leopards. The cheetah is still in Iran, but only 100 of them left, so it's on the edge of extinction. Probably snow falling, horse riders are coming in as hunters, but there was a live animal in the scene I was not aware of. Five years after I took the image, I realized it when reviewing the images, because it was so tiny and very ghostly. It's over here. Let me show you a closer picture. Can you see it? <laughs> or even closer? <laughs> So fox or wolf, probably fox, and it was not there for the complete exposure time, which was 10 seconds, so probably left after a few seconds, curious to know what was this clicking sound. And I have found many of these in my images. This one was very funny, but some were also challenging. I found a snake in front of the image uh, later on. <laughs> and I didn't see it while I was shooting. Another prehistoric um, heritage site in Portugal in the area known as Alqueva. This is near the World Heritage um, town, which I forgot the name. <laughs> uh, but look at the, um, this contrast between the light pollution of the town Evora, yeah, Evora, Evora in the uh, southern part of Portugal. And the, um, na the historic monuments and the natural night sky tells you uh, we are losing the night sky in a way. The night sky that has been there for many generations. There's some connections to some of these hinge with astronomy, at least for calendar use, and this is one of them which is almost proven that was used for calendar. And we are contributing to this program called Astronomy and World Heritage for UNESCO to make um, a portal. But some of the heritage sites I photograph are much newer. This one from um, almost 150 years ago in Washington, D.C. You're looking at the very top of the Capitol Hill. And this was exactly the moment the police officer came. <laughs> and I was in the middle of a street again because, you know, shooting this, I was finding a hole through the trees for that perfect location. And then he was um, suspicious about my activity. It was 11 at night, and he came with very bright headlight with a motorcycle. But then, again, very peacefully after a few minutes because... He realized I'm a National Geographic photographer, and he was a very good fan of Nat Geo, so it ended up very well. 
the moon takes us to another message of the World at Night program, and that's one people, one sky. When we look at the moon rise over Taj Mahal, people see the same view in a few hours in Iran, a few hours later in Greece, and some hours later across the Atlantic in Arizona of the U.S. So we all share the same window to the universe, and that can bring us under one roof, on one single planet. A spaceship takes us all around the co cosmic ocean. And that's how Tuan formed. That was the original message uh, in 2007. In 2009, we became a part of International Year of Astronomy, uh, the first special project. We did a number of uh, exhibits in 30 countries. And it still continue that um, we have a new book, a new exhibition, traveling exhibition in China, for example. This is my colleague, Gernot Meiser, in Germany. He has a portable, the World at Night Planetarium in, in Europe. He takes it to most unusual locations you can imagine. Um, and we are still in touch with Astronomers Without Borders, which has a major program every year in April. It's known as Global Astronomy Month. And another part of the Tuan is to show people that we have lost that connection, but there's still there are many places on, on the Earth where you can see the natural beauty of the night sky. And it has the sense of adventure like going to an unseen cave because so many people have never seen this view. And it's so obvious to me when we do an exhibit, people come to me or after the talks, and ask me, are these images are Photoshop or real? Because they never imagined the Milky Way is visible to naked eye with all the features and the structures, except for the color, in a perfectly dark night. This is how a night reveals, how a night begins in a dark location. Kilimanjaro, on the border of Kenya and Tanzania. Later, darkness arrives. The Magellanic clouds are over the mountains, looking towards the south, together with our own clouds, but very different nature. This one is a massive area of stars. It's a small galaxy, but it's still a massive area of more than a billion stars, probably 10 billion or so. A small Magellanic cloud, a bit further out and a bit smaller, both of them are shining light to us from about 150 to 200,000 years ago. So night sky is indeed a time machine. Then in the next night on this project, I was looking for a tribal person in the nearby village who can find animals at night. And people directed me to this person who had a very good eyesight. So he could see things at night, nobody could. And they were using him as um, defense system because <laughs> he could see lions approaching. So we made a friendship and he was showing me animals at night and I was taking pictures. I couldn't see even one of these animals. He showed me a dozen of them. Not even one of them were visible. <laughs> and I have a good eyesight, but it was a totally different class. Last year in Maine, I had an interesting experience. In the past 20 years, I was recording sounds some, time to time at night. But this sound didn't let my family, we were renting this boathouse during our astronomy retreat. And this lake is protected, so the night sky is very pure and unspoiled here, except for far towns. Um, so it's a very good home to nocturnal species. My family were not expecting this sound the first night. common in North America, northern part of Europe, but most of them are gone from many of these lakes, and people ask me after I posted this on National Geographic social media, 
well, we, we live in, in a lakeside area as well. Why we don't hear loons anymore? Because you have illuminated so much that they cannot live there anymore. You know, loons as nocturnal active species, they need natural night environment. You just turn on one bright LED light on the front of a house here, and after a while they're gone to another side of the lake or totally to another part of the landscape. And this happens so easily. Somebody buy a vacation house on the lakeside, and they go there a few times a year. For the entire year, every night, this LED light is on, on the front of the house, for no reason other than feeling the safety and security. Uh, the, the money is cheap because it's LED light, but the massive impact it's creating by just one single bulb light in a dark environment it's quite notable, and we can easily change that. It's not like plastic in the ocean. It takes us decades to recover from it. It's not like climate change. We can change it very fast by sharing the information to people, by how much we are changing the environment so easily by extra light we don't need. So first, we don't use the light that we don't need. Second, if we use it, we properly shield it towards the ground, where it needs to be illuminating, not to the horizon or to the sky, not as a bulb which is open to the sky. So these are lights known as full cutoff or fully shielded. And third, we switch it off when we don't need it. So it could be motion sensor light, for example. You know, this technology exists for more than three decades, I think. And I have the same problem still with my own neighbors, for example, we, have, we are in a condo association and we have security light the whole night. So we are changing it gradually, but it's such a long time-taking communication to, um, to make an agreement because people are afraid of dark. So that's the first issue we have. And second, we don't know how much impact we are creating with extra lights. So I would say in cities, we have already lost the battle, but we can reduce that for sure. But in natural areas, we can really keep it preserved and uh, unspoiled, but just sharing the information. So this part of the lecture is about the most stunning phenomena we see in the night sky, including aurora borealis. This was the most active northern lights I ever photographed and seen in Iceland. Um, it was a major geomagnetic storm, that means uh, a major eruption coming from the sun, They're caused by a phenomenon known as CME, or coronal mass ejection from the sun. So this massive stream of particles are going through the solar system, and if the Earth is right in that stream, then you get to see a massive aurora storm as well, and some, some issues as well. On, uh, satellite connections, uh, mobile cell phone connections, and so on. It appeared on the cover of an IGO special edition, and this is a close-up of the colors. Most aurora shows do not show you this diversity of colors, and we do not see these colors completely with the eyes unless it's really active. Most people see the northern lights, they can recognize green. If it's more active, you see red as well, and then comes purple, then comes blue, which is quite hard to see. But it is possible to see. If you look at paintings from 19th, 18th century in the National um, Museums in Washington, D.C., Smithsonian, for example, there are a few of them, and you will recognize some aurora displays with blue visible, visible to the artist. This is how a typical aurora storm is appearing, mostly green. And I have a few friends up in Iceland, uh, Lapland, at high latitude. They're astrophotographers using telescopes. They're aiming for galaxies, and they do not like aurora. <laughs> <laughs> they never go out when aurora is active. They wait. If the KP index is zero, they go out. <laughs> and this is why. If you look at the activity, let's see if the video plays. It's dominating the entire sky. To them, it's like this. So, 
solar eclipses, thousands of people travel for every eclipse. Uh, they're called eclipse chasers. Some of them are scientists, some are tourists, some are just nature lovers. And this is the most dynamic natural phenomena happening in only a few minutes of totality. And that's why people are so uh, addicted to it, because you're never completely satisfied with what you have seen. You, you're always thirsty for the next one. A composite image of seven exposures every two minutes combined together to show you a multiple exposure of the phenomenon. And then a wide-angle view of an atmospheric phenomenon, which was very puzzling to me when I captured this on the horizon 12 years ago in Iran. I was there to photograph the setting new moon. After the new moon was gone, this star appeared, first a tiny halo, and then within a minute, a massive fan-shaped object casting shadows. Venus was on the other side, so you can tell what was the magnitude of the object. Uh, I had no idea of that. In, that. in the TV program I had, just two nights before that, I was talking about UFO do not exist. <laughs> <laughs> and gave people all the explanation of how we are misled by the UFO report. And I was looking at one of them. <laughs> So it came overhead, and I was almost ready for a ladder to come down and take me as a specimen. <laughs> <laughs> then I started to make contacts um, here and there to see if there was any rocket uh, launch. Posted the image on a NASA-related webpage. Within 24 hours, the satellite observers, amateur satellite observers, um, responded that this was connected to a classified mission from the U.S. Uh, spy satellite, but the second stage didn't work. So there was massive amount of fuel left in the rocket, which was ejected out above the atmosphere, reflecting sunlight over uh, Middle East in Iran. And this guy uh, photographed a spy satellite, reported back to NASA. So it was a very funny occasion. <laughs> <laughs> but then I realized these are not so rare. If you're especially near countries with more um, rocket activities like Russia or uh, US, then you see time to time. I collected them by other photographers, and these are some samples you see. Some of them are very unusual. Just imagine being a villager in lo northern Lapland and see this. <laughs> of course you report a UFO. It's almost like illustration of a wormhole. Or these, uh, you know, this one in Russia is almost like a biological image. Closer to the ground, we have thunderstorms and lightning, a single exposure. And it's still, from five years ago, it's still very surprising to me that the camera can handle so much dynamic range nowadays. Because our eyes are far beyond the ability of cameras in dynamic range. But it's still, we're getting closer to it uh, nowadays with technology. But then I had a second camera running on that night from the top of Haleakala in Maui, um, about 9,000 feet. It was 2 in the morning, and this was an active supercell. So every minute there was one lightning. The second camera captured the very moment in a much closer view. Above the lightning, there is a phenomenon most people are not aware of. It was discovered in the 1980s, scientifically, reported for many decades by pilots and some marine people nobody believed, and it's known as red sprite. It's a reverse release of energy towards the space. It's released somewhere around 50 to 60 kilometers above us. Sprites are related to lightning, but not exactly lightning. It's a plasma area somewhere mid, uh, in the mid-level of atmosphere, midway to space. They're very faint. You can usually um, don't not seeing it clearly. It's a like very gray, ghostly patch of light appearing for less than a second. So most people miss that, but it is visible to unaided eyes if you know where to look, about 10, 15 degrees above the lightning, 
It should be clear sky. The storm should be at least 100 miles away from you. And this was a perfect condition in Texas. It's a, one of the best places to see that with open sky and thunderstorms on the clouds in summertime and late spring. A close-up with a telephoto lens shows you all the activity happening. And then a video of many sprites that night, a time-lapse video. I have frozen the moments of um, time-lapse where the sprite is happening. <laughs> the glow down here is from a nearby light. This was another storm active, at least 150, 200 miles away. And the green is air glow. There is a connection between light, lightning and air glow, in fact. Some images are processed for fine, fine art. This is beyond my usual processing. The uh, foreground is enhanced in color and contrast because it's used for print by National Geographic Fine Art Galleries. Still, it's a single exposure, a panorama of single exposures, but processing is more enhanced because we lose a part of that in print. Grand Teton National Park in a summer night where air glow was the most intense I have ever documented in 25 years or so. Um, strangely in hand, uh, strong on that night. At the beginning, it was very annoying to us. We were two, and we thought, you know, this night is completely gone. There's just too much air glow. But then I realized air glow itself is the subject tonight because it had so many details and patterns i never seen before. Air glow is completely colorless to the eyes. It's similar to air glow to aurora to the camera, but they're more parallel to the horizon while aurora can come in any direction. And they're moving very slow because they're very high altitude, almost 90 to 100 kilometers above us. I was always intending to go to this location because when I was a teenager in, in Iran, I received a book of images by Ansel Adams, and this particular one of a Snake River and Teton was just engraved in my memory for so many years. And finally I got there to document the same scene at night. I realized these trees are much taller in seven decades. <laughs> so in order to see that the Snake River bend, you have to use a crane now. Meteors and meteor showers under a very bright moon in the Atacama Desert. This one is in northern Maine. It's right after the meteor is gone. It was a bolide, a very bright meteor. We call it fireball, and if it explodes, we call it bolide. A trail is left from the meteor is known as persistent meteor train, and in that particular view was up to 45 minutes after the meteor was gone. Most majestic, even more interesting than eclipses, I would say, is a major comet, a great comet. Unfortunately, they come only on average once a decade. Last time uh, in the Northern Hemisphere was in 1997. In 2007, we had one in the Southern Hemisphere. This is 97, an image which really changed my career. This was the first image I ever sold, and I did it as an assignment for a cover of our astronomy magazine in Iran, and I became a so-called so professional photographer. <laughs> There's a nice story about this, but let me check the timing. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So, yeah, let's move on to this part, which is about not the beauty of landscape, but do you see anything specific in this moonlight image of Grand Canyon? It's this light from 90 miles away, and it's not a town. It is a power station next to the town of Page. It's brighter than the entire town of Page. Mm, it was shut down a few months ago, I think, according to my uh, knowledge. But for many years it was there, the, one of the last remaining cold fire power stations in northern Arizona. And I, I would say the light here was used more for identity, not for safety, because any airplane can see this power station from many miles with fraction of this light. 
But the identity was the reason, because this is a Navajo, it's a Native American area, and they were um, always with a lot of financial problems. Now they have the power, they have um, ability to run a power station for their society, and they like to show it very promptly. So I would say light is often used in many areas as identity. Small villages are using light to show they're larger in population. They're more important. Light is used for art, Prague with the new moon, and it was really perfectly designed. I, I, I saw the shades, and they're cutting exactly on the wall, so it's not going to the sky that much. Even from a long distance, I made longer exposures, I realized the amount of light pollution is very minimal. It was a new light. Light is used for art in festivals, Art uh, Light Festival in Cascais of Portugal every September. Light is used for advertising. The casino and hotel in Las Vegas, known as Luxor. And it resembles, according to their website, this light resembles the spirit of ancient Egyptians going to the heaven from the center of Las Vegas. <laughs> so... That I cannot understand perfectly, but then <laughs> I made a calculation of how much light they're producing inside, because this is the strongest light ray going to space from Earth. Yes, every night in the past 25 years, at least for six hours per night, and for nothing. I mean, it's just for advertising. And the amount of light is equal to two, running two hospitals. So there are lights inside two major hospitals, or a town of 10,000 population, the street lights, because it's so massive. But the waste of energy is a minor issue. I had a closer look. This video is showing you hundreds of bats, millions of insects captured by this light, migrating birds as well. And they usually die after a while from being exhausted and overactive because there are so many sources of food here. Um, and they just keep going, keep going, and they die. And you don't expect, you know, so many bats in the middle of Las Vegas. Lights are capturing birds and bats at nighttime, especially a disaster for migrating birds. This is visible from anywhere in the city. It's now part of identity. 20 miles away, it's still visible. It's visible from International Space Station. And that uh, could be a good identity advertising, but it's very bad for environment because any migrating bird passing over the area could be disturbed. Their migration path is disturbed by these light. They come to the cities and then die because of being lost. And this was first noticed in the 1980s in the cities of Chicago and Toronto. People realize there are thousands of birds dying in the migrating season. Uh, they found them every morning around the skyscrapers. Nobody knew why they were just smashing into the windows. Why they're coming to the cities until we found out they're coming because of light pollution at nighttime. It's a source of a landmark, a new landmark that captured them in the migration system instead of the stars. And the estimation of International Dark Sky Association is that there are 4 billion birds dying in the world uh, every year because of the lights. We are in Death Valley National Park, and still Las Vegas is boldly visible. This is a dark sky area. This is from 90 miles away, and this is Los Angeles from almost 160 miles away. Highly recommend you to have a look at this um, recent article we did online for Nat Geo. Just Google Nat Geo light pollution or on my website, uh, bobaktafrishi.com slash media. And this is another example by my colleague Ajay Talwar from India, the trails of the birds over Sydney Opera House. Many of them are migrating birds captured. Beijing um, Olympics area and that's uh, completely covered by new white blue LEDs. A village in Thailand, photographed by my colleague Jeff Dai from China, um, completely changed to white blue LEDs, used to be a stargazing location. It's almost like daytime under these lights. The amount of light changing in Europe, in North Africa in 20 years. 
And the best view is from a friend like Don Pettit, who is an astronaut. We are frequently in touch. He's also an astrophotographer, in fact, but doing this from a space, <laughs> not from the ground. Uh, he has a marvelous book uh, released a few years ago. I highly recommend you to have a look. And um, he has the best view to most of these things. Uh, you see air glow over there, but you see also an island, which is actually a country. This is the country of the North Korea. They switch off the light a few hours after sunset. In a great democracy, this is a mandatory. <laughs> they switch off the whole country. It's, I usually mention this is a paradise for astrophotographers with a <laughs> one-way ticket. <laughs> but compared just to capitals, you know, how much difference we have and heavily illuminated borders. You can have a look at our website for a variety of these images or um, at our book, uh, which is available now in bookstores and online. For a limited time, I have made the book available with signature and personalized message before my next trip, in fact. So then I'm gone. So it will be available until probably mid-March if you like, uh, like to have a signed copy. Otherwise, you can find it on many of the stores. We have four editions, the Chinese one coming later this year. The other three are available already. And we look forward to have it in many languages to share this message, especially the chapter five of this book is completely dedicated to light pollution. Uh, it's an illustrated book of a lot of large, nice images, but the stories are there as well. Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed it. Great. Uh, thank you for the fantastic talk. Um, we have like one or two minutes for uh, quick questions from the audience uh, for Babak here. Um, yes, yes, please. Um, could you tell us uh, when you're not using the modified camera, what kind of camera are you using, and what kind, what ranges of lenses in terms of f-stops and focal lengths you're using, and usually if you're using tracking or not using tracking? It's not essential to use a modified camera. Most of the images that I've done were with regular cameras. But uh, with regular cameras, needs to be better to be a full frame, such as Canon 60, Nikon D850. These are my main cameras. So many of the Sony cameras, like A7 series, are perfect. And lenses, you need a fast wide-angle lens, such as 14, 2.8, 21.4, and so on. Tracking, uh, I usually use it when it's really a deep escape image, means uh, revealing objects in the background of the sky, details of nebulosity and the landscape. Then I use a tracking at half the speed, which is a trick to combine in a single exposure. Uh, do you use a tripod only for tracking, or do you use a telescope as well? No, no, tripod only. A small tracker, such as Polari by Vixen, or a Sky Adventure and similar. These are very portable um, star trackers you can put in your camera bag. Yes, please. Yes. I was wondering, have you thought about this new development of having thousands of microsatellites in the sky and how that would affect this? Yeah, I would say it's affecting astronomers um, more than night escape photographers, but some of them are quite bright, so it's going to affect these images as well. To a naked eye um, observer, most of these are magnitude 5 and 6 and higher when it's in proper orbit. At the beginning, when it's in a low orbit, they can be as bright as magnitude 0 and minus 1, boldly visible in the night sky. But it's a short period of time until they go to the next level. However, we're just talking about one project. When this project is done, then we have other companies coming in. So without a regulation, international regulation, I would say the natural night sky will be gone, simply, if we continue that with this number of small satellites the cubes of uh, 40,000, 50,000 constellation. Uh, they, there will be so many launching satellites in low orbits that at any given time you will see 50 to 100 of them in the sky with naked eye when these are complete. So that's the thing. There needs to be a regulation. Yes, please. Oh, there is one person then come to you. Um, so, could you talk a little bit more about the, the phenomenon of the sprites that happen in the thunderstorm? What is it exactly that causes them to go 
glow like that. And, and so it's a release of energy similar to lightning itself, but this <coughs> release of high energy particles is going upward, except, except of, um, instead of downward. And it's released somewhere in mid, uh, middle of atmosphere, 50, 60 kilometers above us, creating a plasma area because of the high energy charged particles. Yes. Last question. Um, could you tell a little bit about like the like the retreat you mentioned in Maine? Sort of like what is like the sign up procedure, or like how can I guess yeah, this you is, get to know? This is that picture also from yeah. that area. Um, the, um, you you don't need to be an experienced one. It's open to both beginners and pros. Uh, it's also open to people who just want to come for stargazing. It's a family-oriented place. It's a camp, so there's no luxury accommodation, but it's a very clean area and. Um, night is very, very pure there. We don't have any major light pollution. But um, the sky is, on average, about 50% clear. So out of four or five nights, we will have two, three nights of clear and two nights of cloudy sky. And the procedure will be on my website within a week or so. Thank you. <laughs> so I think, um, are there a few of you with the books to sign or very good here? Yes, yes, yes. I will be available for that, yes.